This is the Digital Savage Experience Podcast, hosted by Roman Prokopchuk, bringing you all things digital marketing, tech, business, and motivation. What's stopping you from becoming relentless in all aspects of life? Are you ready to become a digital savage? Let's get into today's episode. Hey everyone, this is Roman Prokopchuk and this is the Digital Savage Experience Podcast. Today I have with me Kim Addis, the president and founder of Frame of Mind Coaching and Journal Engine Software, author, speaker, entrepreneur, coach, and mother of five. Kim has years of experience coaching many of America's most respected leaders. Recognized as an expert in the area of thought mastery, Kim uses her unique philosophy and quirky coaching style to help her clients deal with core issues and shift their thinking in order to yield extraordinary results. Thank you for joining me today. I am so happy to be here. Thank you. Awesome. So how did you get started in what you're doing now? And what is the road that kind of got you to the entrepreneurial endeavors that you founded? So I would say that I'm a bit of a serial entrepreneur. So I started when I was very, very young. I owned a balloon business. Uh, That didn't lead me here, but it, you know, it indicates that I'm really interested in business and have that entrepreneurial spirit. But the business before this one was uh, a company where where we used to build simulation-based assessments. And the purpose of those assessments was to help companies make better hiring decisions. And we were building simulations where simulations weren't even cool yet. And what we did was we would test people for a variety of things, their personality, their IQ, their skill sets. And we would put all the findings together to really try to predict who would be the best person for this job or who would be the top performer. And what we discovered was something really super interesting, in my mind anyway, is that it didn't matter which job we were testing for, which industry, which position, it didn't really matter. There was one piece of information, one data point, which really stood out over and above all the other data points to determine whether someone would succeed or not. And that was their level of emotional resilience. So not even emotional intelligence, but emotional resilience. So that was interesting to me. What is emotional resilience exactly is a person's ability to bounce back from adversity with speed and agility and even leverage the adversity, do something good with it. And so I ran that company for many years. I ended up selling my shares and that led me to here. I started to understand that people by and large know what they're supposed to be doing, but they're not doing it. And that has to do with their emotional resilience. That has to do with how they think about what they need to do. Something gets in the way, something stops them. And so that got me thinking, what if we could help people build their emotional resilience? What if we could help people think about things in a way that makes it easy for them to take the actions that they know they need to take? And so that's when I started framing my coaching. That's pretty cool. I mean, the the resilience part, I think it's very important, like learning and trial and error and going through hardship. So I mean, getting to a end result, starting a company, you're going to keep failing. And the people that end up succeeding will have that emotional resilience, like you said. Right. So we all fail at something, right? Like life gives us enough experiences to test out our our response to failure, whether it's in school as a kid, on sports teams, in relationships, as running a business. I mean, we can face failure at any turn and how we respond to that will determine our success and basically how, how great our lives are, both things. No, I agree. And like you said, you've been doing, you know, in your former company assessments and you have experience in that. Have you found that entrepreneurs or, you know, executives or professionals have become more or less emotionally resilient? And if so, either way, what can help you achieve that? Yeah. So, I mean, if you look at the, the, the world of entrepreneurship, most entrepreneurs fail. So the very few, the kind of the population that does succeed, you will notice does have a higher level of emotional resilience. They have to. And so do they build it even further over time? Sure. Because like take something as simple as marriage or a failed relationships in your first relationship. When, when that first relationship, even imagine as a teenager or a young adult, when that fails, you're destroyed. 
Well, when the next one fails, you're a little less destroyed and, and so on and so forth. And the same thing goes in business. When you confront an adversity, when you lose a client, when you don't have make a sale, the more you experience that and realize it's not the end of the world, the more you're able to recover or the quicker, more quickly you're able to recover. And that's what we're after. So when you see very senior executives confront issues that for you or me would be massive, it's because they've been down that road and they understand that that road isn't the end of the road. It's just an experience. And so, yes, we see that people who have been around for a while, their emotional resilience is much higher for things that are fairly complex for the rest of us. No, I agree. And things like, I think, personal and professional hardships or, you know, adversities kind of tie in. So things like, you know, two and, two and a half months ago, my grandfather passed away. So I could have, I mean, I was sad. I went through kind of the coping and, you know, the, the different stages right. of, of loss. But I kind of turned it around and decided to push harder in terms of all my endeavors because knowing how proud he was of me and he wouldn't want me to just be depressed and be down and just... Just give up on everything. Well, and funny, my, my mom passed away in January. I'm sorry and, for your loss. I'm sorry for your loss too, but here's the thing is what you just did, what you just described is you actually tuned in to your grandfather and said, what would he want for me? How would he want me to behave? How would he want me to be? Let me line up with that rather than the feeling of loss and sadness and emptiness. Let me line up with something bigger, stronger, grander. And really that's the definition of emotional resilience. Yeah, and I think I, I did it really quickly. So I think that's important in business or personal life if you do that as quick as possible. Now, I'm not saying force yourself to do it, but doing it and being self-aware enough to understand what that person would have wanted from you and something positive is a lot better than you know being depressed and then getting your health down and getting into a position where it doesn't benefit anyone around you. Exactly. So every time I make a meal for like 20 people, I see my mother looking at my table and thinking, yes, I'm really proud of you. That that was a good meal. <laughs> no, yeah, I agree. Um, I think it's become easier, not necessarily easier, but tolerable week to week with kind of like the, the, the pain of it and just remembering kind of the happy thoughts over, you know, that, that painful part of, you know, the, the last days. Sure. It's, it's about tuning in and, and tuning in in a way where you still feel a presence rather than feeling a loss. No, I agree. So you do have obviously that coaching component to your background and what you do. Have you found any common issues that people go through in terms of their profession or trying to get, you know, past a professional hurdle? So what I have found, uh, you know, our, our market is that we coach the highly driven population, whether it's entrepreneurs, executives, senior leaders, et cetera. We coach those people who really are determined and, and driven to reach higher goals, except that they face some kind of a wall or they face some kind of frustration. And nine times out of 10, that frustration has to do with other people. And so it could be a conflict that they're confronting. It could be that they are a leader and they can't get their people to mobilize and take action or to produce. Or it could be even a personal matter where something in their family life or their children, something's not going right. Could be a, a child who, who is struggling in school or even into drugs. It doesn't really matter. But usually what we find is that at some point, they're facing a conflict or a, a, a source of tension that is related to other people in their lives. And we see that over and over and over again. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I think a lot of stuff that I have emotional intelligence to in dealing with uh, clients, customers, other professionals, why their mood may be a little different or why they may be acting the way they're acting is like you said, something may be going on in their personal life that obviously throws off how they perform professionally. It could be a, a personal issue affecting a professional issue, but it could also be, you know, uh, for example, I'm coaching someone right now and she's fairly new to a senior position and, you know, there's a lot of weird tension going on uh, you know, there are political issues going on in the work environment and she's unclear about how people think about her and see her and there are power plays going on. And so in, what, what we see is that people struggle with people. People struggle to understand where someone else is coming from and, and what they're there for, what it's about. They struggle with people issues more than anything else. No, I agree. And I think making that jump to a, a senior management, you know, uh, executive position, it's sometimes hard. 
because the previous roles I actually last week heard uh, Seth Godin speak in person about okay. a, a charity event about uh, management versus leadership. So obviously not every manager is a leader and yep. the concept of anyone in any position can you know have leadership qualities. So how do you, when somebody comes, like you said, that person with the, the internal politics and maybe being a people manager and less like a leader, how would they develop their leadership skills? So we believe that really great leaders do two things. They have a great degree of self-awareness and do their own personal development work. And number two is they learn some very basic but critical coaching skills. So those two things combined really develop fantastic leaders. So we start with helping a person understand the relationship between the way they think and their outcomes. So for example, as a leader, if I see someone in my organization, let's say slacking off and I'm, and I'm putting quotes to that and I, and that irritates me or aggravates me and I want to go and address it from the get go, my view of that other person is negative. And if my view of that other person is negative, I can't bring them to a better place. It's virtually impossible. So I need to clean up my thinking about that other person first. I need to address it very differently by assuming positive intent and understanding what that person's goals are and lining up their goals with my own goals, my corporate goals, and then approaching them. I have to clean myself up, my thinking first before I even attempt to try to lead them, manage them, or coach them, right? So the, the work is always, always for a leader to start with themselves and then to try to after that point, influence and mobilize people to see the potential, the possibilities, and to really focus on what you want and on the strengths of the individual in front of you instead of on the weaknesses or the shortfalling. No, I agree. I think changing that kind of uh, mindset and a lot of times kind of a mindset of, of blame and not uh, taking accountability for things would be kind of that you know leadership angle um i think i try to take accountability as best as possible at times in previous director roles and at other companies even you know you're like the president or you know the the main leader so everything technically falls on you regardless if a team member makes a mistake and i think it's important to find what the issue is and then tackle it with you know that prospective team member to to build them up and have them learn from it instead of kind of throw them under the bus. Well, you said something very interesting. You said the word take accountability. So most people, when you think of the word accountable, you think about holding someone accountable. And so it's really hard to lead from a place where you're holding others accountable. What you're really saying is you need to do what I need you to do in order for us all to be happy. I love the words that you use, which is I'm taking accountability. In other words, I am demonstrating accountability, I am being accountable, and I come to my leadership role and encourage the team that I lead to also take accountability, to be accountable. It's not my job to hold you accountable, it's your job to be accountable. And there's a huge distinction in leadership styles with that, what sounds like a very minor difference, it's a massive difference. No, I agree. And I think, I mean, I'm 34, going to turn 35. So 10 years ago, I may have not thought like that. So like you said, all the experiences and all the setbacks and things like that, I was able to pivot quickly and build, have them as building blocks onto my character and management style. And then obviously when I had responsibilities with people under me, building up that kind of leadership core. Right, right. But, but what you're saying is I, I show up being accountable and so I attract and I build other people who are also accountable not to me but to the idea to the goal to the project to themselves yep yep I think to themselves and it's it's um regardless of what the mission is to the mission and everybody has exactly. to kind of believe in it exactly and, you know not necessarily every person is the right fit for every company or every endeavor but building the right team and doesn't have to be a team of you know, five all-stars, but everybody's, you know, fits a purpose and goes after the mission, that team is obviously stronger than if you stack it with C-suite executives that may not necessarily mesh or fit. Exactly. Exactly. So what's one thing that you can kind of leave with the audience in terms of how they can develop um, as a leader or any other advice you would like to leave? You know, for me, one of the things that we do when we coach our 
it's for all generally leaders is we ask them to journal in an online journal. And the reason we do that is we want to see how their thinking is impacting their results. So the journaling aspect allows us to see how they're thinking about pretty much everything, how they think in their personal lives, how they think in their professional lives. And what we're really looking for is a pattern of beliefs. What do you believe to be true? And so when you're asking me, what's the advice I want to leave behind? It's this. As a leader, when you feel stuck, on any subject, whether it's related to a strategic decision or when it's related to hiring or firing a person or if it's related to helping really increase the potential of a person, I encourage you to take a piece of paper and a pen or go to your computer and write down this question, what do I believe to be true about this situation? And ask yourself if those beliefs are e even aligned with the goal. So if let's say, you want someone to really step up their performance, but you believe they're lazy, that's not aligned with the goal. And so ask yourself, what do I believe to be true? And are those beliefs aligned with the goal? If not, I need to make an adjustment. No, I agree. Because like you said, like if you write it down, there's nothing you can do about it. If you actually outline it and the pieces don't fit, you can't necessarily make them fit. You can repurpose, you know, certain things or certain um, assets and, and people under you. But like you said, that overall kind of mapping is important, I think, as well. Right. And, and, and what I'm really honing in on is that your beliefs will guide your behaviors. And if your beliefs aren't consistent with your goals, your behaviors won't follow through either. So you will not be able to achieve the goals you're trying to achieve. So really hone in on those beliefs. If you're feeling stuck, ask yourself, what do I believe to be true about this situation? And will those beliefs lead me to the goals I'm trying to achieve? No, I agree. Uh, that's obviously a lot of times easier said than done. But I think like working on yourself and, you know, being self-aware and building yourself up and constantly learning and adapting because, you know, dealing with a lot of C-suite level executives and my career and, you know, starting different endeavors, sometimes people aren't necessarily that self-aware or they got to somewhere they are a lot easily or without some kind of chaotic road. So they may not have that kind of development. So I think it's important to kind of understand that as well. Absolutely. Sometimes people just stumble into their success, right? I think that's what you're describing. Yeah. And I mean, I'm not saying all those people are, you know, bad at what they do. They may be already, you know, equipped to handle that situation. But a lot of the time you have to understand that, you know, your role may be different than another person and kind of dealing or, you know, working hand in hand with somebody like that as well. Right. And so the there's, you know, a saying, what got you here won't get you there. And so in order to get to a new place, you have to really ask yourself what thinking is required in order to get me to this new place. Because the thinking that I had got me here, but if I want to be somewhere else, I need to adapt and adopt new thinking. No, I agree. And I think kind of uh, also having or developing some sort of empathy and people skills, how important do you think that is? And how does one, if they're not necessarily a people person, but gets thrown in a leadership position, how can they develop that or become a better, you know, communicator or people person. Yeah. So I think the word empathy is vastly misunderstood and I'm probably one of the only coaches in the world who will say this, but I think that as a leader, empathy can be actually a little bit debilitating. So let me, let me kind of describe it first before you go, what, <laughs> um, what is empathy? Empathy is literally, it's an emotional experience. It's the idea of putting yourself in the shoes of somebody else to feel their emotional state. So it's not just about understanding them. It's not about seeing where they're coming from intellectually. It's about an emotional uh, experience where you're able to feel their emotional state. So imagine you're walking by and you see someone drowning in a pool. What is their emotional state? Can you describe it? They're distraught, they're in fear, you know. All those things. And so if I take a moment to feel empathy, then all of a sudden I'm distraught and I have fear and I've instantly disabled myself from being able to be helpful. And so what I want to have instead of empathy is I want to have compassion. I want to see someone drowning. Intellectually, I want to go, oh my goodness, they need my help. And I have the capacity and ability to help them. In order for me to do that, I need to kind of very quickly mobilize myself and imagine them safely out of the pool. So I need to stand there and, you know, lean in and grab them and pull them out. 
So I need to have some semblance of my own emotional state, which is calm, clarity, compassion, not their emotional state. And that's a very important distinction for a leader. I encourage leaders to take the time to understand where someone is coming from, but at the same time, hold a vision of their success, hold a vision of their ability, hold a vision of their skill set. Because if you devolve into experiencing the emotions of someone, now you're both in the pool drowning together. Not a good idea. No, What that's true. That? No, I, I actually agree. That's actually like, I've never really thought about it like that. You're not, if you're, if you're in that situation and you're not doing yourself or that person any good without having like a re resolution or some kind of solution in that instance, jumping in or getting a life preserver or anything like that and not simply like freezing in that situation, I think would be the, you know, having empathy and, and having kind of fear. Right. So is empathy sometimes appropriate? Yes, but not in the role of a leader. Yeah, that's actually like a really good uh, standpoint. I really never thought of it like that. Yeah, it ruffles a few feathers every now and again, but I, I think it's important. I think it's important for a leader to stay on their path and to, to have vision and this idea that, yes, some people will sometimes get trapped in an emotional state. And it's really important that you acknowledge it, right? You validate it, but you don't go there with them. No, I agree. And I, I, I guess that's that's a main part of leadership. I mean, that's that's why you're a leader. You can kind of guide that ship and if need be, get the people out of the water. Exactly. Well, I really appreciate your time. It was a really interesting conversation. Can you let the audience know how they can find you or some of the things you may have going on? Sure. Well, best way to find us is to check us out online. It's www.frameofmindcoaching.com. And there's a ton of stuff to look at on the website. Uh, we have a blog, we have a podcast. Uh, we also have an invitation for a complimentary coaching call. And what we do is we ask you to fill out a bit of a self awareness survey, see where you are at this point in life and do a little journaling. And then you get to speak to an actual coach who will give you a little bit of a taste for frameline coaching. And a lot of people have said that that conversation has been uh, quite powerful. So I encourage you to do that. And we're everywhere. We're on social media, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. We're, we just do it all. Awesome. Really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. It's been a very interesting conversation. I appreciate your podcast. Thank you. This podcast has been brought to you by Nova Zora Digital. Find out how Nova Zora Digital can help your company grow online. Learn more at NovaZoraDigital.com. Until next time, all you digital savages.